was 1897. Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee celebrated the glories of the mighty British Empire. The event was recorded in an assortment of souvenirs and in reams of enthusiastic songs and poems. Hail our great queen in her regalia, one foot in Canada, the other in Australia. Representatives from all parts of the empire gathered in London for a great procession. An article in the Times asserted, history may be searched and searched in vain to discover so wonderful an exhibition of allegiance and brotherhood amongst so many myriads of men. The mightiest and most beneficial empire ever known in the annals of mankind. At the time of the Jubilee, the empire had over 372 million subjects in India, Australia, Africa, Canada, the West Indies, and many other parts of the world. All these peoples were governed by one of the world's smallest countries. Tiny Britain, in 1897, ruled an empire consisting of more than 11 million square miles of land. Mighty imperial powers such as the Roman Empire had ruled vast areas before, but they had generally spread out from a single centre across adjoining land masses, wherever large armies could travel. By the 15th century, however, Europeans had made advances in ship design, mapping techniques and navigational science that permitted long voyages of exploration across previously uncharted seas. Improvements in weapons, especially the development of guns and cannons, allowed small numbers of Europeans, landing from their ships, to gain control rapidly over local inhabitants whose weapons were less advanced. These technological advances sparked the voyages of Christopher Columbus and other Europeans exploring for wealth and later for colonies overseas. England's search for wealth from abroad was actively encouraged by the merchants of 16th century London who wanted new markets in which to sell their goods as well as the means to import precious silks, spices and other foreign products. These merchants formed special companies such as the Company of Merchant Adventurers of England for the Discovery of Lands Unknown and they hired explorers to discover new lands and trade routes for them. Sir Walter Raleigh, one of the most famous early explorers, summed up their aims. Whosoever commands the sea commands the trade. Whosoever commands the trade commands the riches of the world and consequently the world itself. Queen Elizabeth I gave permission for her favorite explorers to discover barbarous countries and enjoy the same forever. At first, explorers and trading companies often ran the lands they claimed under royal charters, even creating private armies to police their claims. This militia was formed by the East India Company. In Canada, the Hudson's Bay Company was given a royal charter to be true and absolute lords and proprietors of the land on condition that they paid the King of England two elks and two black beavers whenever he visited Canada which he never did. The hunger for wealth motivated Britain to join other countries in buying and selling human beings. In 1663, King Charles II gave a charter to the Company of Royal Adventurers, which took guns, ammunition, liquor, beads and cotton cloth to the west coast of Africa and traded them for Africans who had been captured by rival tribes. Boats packed with this human cargo crossed the Atlantic to the West Indies where the slaves were sold to European settlers who required large numbers of people to work on their sugar plantations. The boats returned to England laden with West Indian sugar and rum. In the early years, although thousands of slaves died during the crossings, shareholders in the Africa Trading Company made profits of 300%. In 1808, Britain abolished the slave trade. <laughs> 
In the years that followed, the British Navy patrolled the seas like police, stopping other nations from trading in slaves. Moral objections played a role in Britain's abolition of the slave trade. But there were also practical reasons. Britain was industrialising rapidly and focusing its energies on the wealth to be made from manufacturing. Shipping space used for slaves left less space for cargo more valuable to the growing British factories. Until late in the 18th century, the overseas empires of Britain, France, Spain, Portugal and the Netherlands, based on sea trade in slaves, spices, silks and other exotic goods, were on a fairly equal footing. But by the turn of the century, the balance was tipping in Britain's favour. In the 19th century, mismanagement and corruption among trading company officials and the wish to control and profit from major sources of trade led the British government to take over the lands granted by royal charter and make them colonies of the crown. By this time, the country had begun on a grand scale to develop its industry, introducing a host of mechanical devices to speed the production of goods and finding new ways of organising work. Britain became the first industrialised nation of the world and its industry turned out unprecedented amounts of goods. Britain soon had more factory-made goods than the people of the country could afford to buy. British manufacturers needed to sell abroad or export, while at the same time they had to import items not available in Britain. Raw materials for their factories, as well as food for their factory workers. British industry began to look upon the country's growing empire as a marketplace where it could buy and sell to suit its needs. For example, British industrialists bought raw cotton cheaply from India, turned the cotton into cloth in newly built textile mills in the north of England, sold much of the cloth at home and the surplus in India, at prices with which local handloom weavers could not compete. The British prevented India from building factories that could compete with those in Britain. Throughout the 19th century, as Britain's trade and empire grew, the proportion of national income that came from abroad also rose. In 1831, one-sixth of gross national income came from abroad. In 1875, nearly half of it did. British ports handled gold, silver and diamonds, sugar, coconuts and pineapples, furs, wools, rubber, cocoa, tea, among the riches that the empire provided for the tiny island mother country. British companies, investors, merchants and speculators made profits from abroad in two ways. Directly through trade and indirectly through loans and investments used to build factories and railroads in other countries. The profits from these investments nearly all came back to Britain. In 1899, roughly four-fifths of the profits from abroad came from loans and investments and only one-fifth came from trade. Although life changed for everyone, the British people did not all benefit in the same way from the empire. The aristocracy and upper middle class, the large landowners and entrepreneurs with money to invest abroad, increased their fortunes immensely. The middle classes enjoyed the products of foreign lands and the general rise in living standards that empire trade and investment helped to bring about. For the working classes, overseas trade created more job opportunities. In addition to wealth, Britain's colonies provided security for the tiny island nation. In the words of one of the country's prominent philosophers, colonization is a step towards universal peace. It renders war impossible among a large number of otherwise independent communities. The colonies offered other attractions, for many, the chance to make a better living than at home. Between 1812 and 1912, 20 million Britons emigrated. The vast majority left for the United States or Empire countries. The British set off for the colonies for different reasons. Young men were offered the chance of careers as soldiers or colonial administrators. 
Some of the earliest emigrants, such as the Puritans, left home because they were persecuted for religious or political beliefs. Some went because they could have their own farms in sparsely settled territories. This was especially attractive to those forced off their farms when Parliament passed the Enclosure Acts, driving hundreds of thousands of farmers off lands they had been allowed to use and leaving the lands in the hands of large landowners. Some were convicts, sent abroad by the government. More than 140,000 prisoners were sent to North America and Australia. Others had dreams of wealth. The population of Australia doubled in the gold rush years of 1851 to 1861. Most of the hopeful diggers failed to make fortunes and turned to farming. Thousands more rushed to South Africa when diamonds were discovered in Kimberley. Irish people emigrated at the rate of 300,000 a year during the potato famines of the 1840s. Some were helped by the government to pay their way abroad. Thousands of Scottish people moved to Canada when they were forced off their farms as landowners in closed lands for sheep farming. Cecil Rhodes, who amassed a fortune in southern Africa and with it great political power, became a leading advocate of imperialist expansion. Rhodes believed that the empire could solve social problems in Britain. In 1895, he said, I was in the east end of London yesterday and attended a meeting of the unemployed. I listened to the wild speeches which were just a cry for bread, bread, and I became more than ever convinced of the importance of imperialism. In order to save the 40 million inhabitants of the United Kingdom from a bloody civil war, we colonial statesmen must acquire new lands to settle the surplus population, to provide new markets for the goods produced in the factories and mines. The empire, as I have always said, is a bread and butter question. If you want to avoid civil war, you must become imperialists. Rhodes summed up why Britain wanted colonies. But how could it manage to keep getting new ones? Britain was not the only country that had been trying to build an empire, and in the 18th and 19th centuries, colonies were won and lost through armed conflict. During the 18th century, Britain took Gibraltar from Spain and also won parts of the West Indies and North America from France in a series of colonial wars. After the British and their allies defeated Napoleon's forces early in the 19th century, more French colonies became British. The rush to divide Africa into European colonies began through negotiation rather than war. At a conference in Berlin in 1884, Europe's most powerful nations split Africa among themselves. No Africans were consulted. Britain emerged with control over the territories in yellow. African chiefs who could not be tricked or bribed into giving up their land according to the conference decisions were persuaded by modern European weapons. British weapons were used over the next two decades to seize vast amounts of additional African territory, from tribal lands to once powerful kingdoms. In their quest to control Africa, the British fought not only black Africans, but also other Europeans, including the Dutch South African Boers. British explorers and missionaries followed the courses of African rivers deep into unexplored regions of the continent and claimed their discoveries for Britain, just as the early seafarers had done. The last big addition to the empire came at the end of World War I. In the Middle East, the peace settlement gave Britain mandates over the areas shown in yellow, which had been taken from Germany's ally, the Ottoman Empire. Former German territories in Africa were also transferred to Britain. The Middle East mandates included regions where large quantities of oil were being discovered. While they were not officially colonies, Britain wanted control over them not just for the sake of oil, but to safeguard the vital sea passage to India via the Suez Canal. India was, in all respects, Britain's most valuable possession and, for many, important mainly as a source of riches. But India also had a mystical aura. 
the jewel in the crown, that brightness in England's starry eyes, these were the poetic images that India evoked. Not everyone in Britain saw India as a source for wealth. Many who made their way to India and elsewhere were missionaries who believed that the main purpose of empire was to spread Christianity and British values to unbelievers. Hundreds of different missionary groups maintained Christian missions and schools throughout the empire and, even as early as 1897, claimed 10 million converts. Similar missionary zeal inspired teachers, doctors, civil servants and other dedicated British men and women to work in the colonies toward improving the lives of often hungry, largely uneducated populations. Through such efforts, methods of sanitation, public health measures and other improvements in daily life were introduced in many places. Cecil Rhodes put it this way, we happen to be the best people in the world with the highest ideals of decency and justice and liberty and peace and the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for humanity. This was the British Empire in 1921, when it covered more territory than ever before or since. This is what was left of the empire 60 years later. Among the factors that contributed to the empire's fall were changes brought about by two world wars and the emergence of the United States and the Soviet Union as superpowers after World War II. Another was the growing level of national pride among colonial peoples, swelling the demand for independence. While Britain officially favoured the right of peoples to choose their own forms of government, British support of the principle wavered when independence movements threatened to take away sources of income or political power that had long been in British hands. The British were especially unsympathetic to demands for independence from non-white colonial peoples who were generally regarded either with contempt as inferiors or with pity as people who needed to be saved from their own misguided ways. All men are created equal, with unalienable rights to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. So said 13 of Britain's North American colonies in their Declaration of Independence. The Declaration voiced a desire for freedom that would eventually be echoed and struggled for in all of Britain's colonial possessions. In a sense, the year 1776 marked the beginning of the end of the British Empire. At that time, about one-sixth of all British subjects lived in the North American colonies, governed by a king, George III, and a parliament in London, both concerned mainly with the needs of the mother country, Britain. The North American colonies, like those to follow, were treated as a source of raw materials and as a market for British manufactured goods. When Britain ran up large debts fighting a series of wars with France, largely to protect land in the American colonies from seizure by the French, taxes were levied in the colonies to help pay those debts. At first, the people of colonial America didn't seek independence, but resentful at being taxed when they had no voice in Parliament, they raised the cry, no taxation without representation. Americans protested first by boycotting British goods and even attacking British trading vessels. Eventually riots broke out. The arrival of British troops to subdue the riots served to increase the demand for independence. 
1775, a full-scale revolution began. The British sent professional soldiers to put down the revolutionary forces made up mostly of untrained protesters banded together as an army. The American colonists not only won their freedom, but also set a precedent for future colonial independence struggles. Britain treated other white settler colonies more flexibly. The new pattern was set in Canada, which in 1867 became a dominion rather than a colony. While Britain kept control of Canada's foreign affairs, local affairs were controlled by a Canadian parliament in Ottawa. Australia took the same road in 1901 as had New Zealand in 1870. Each became responsible for internal affairs while Britain kept control of foreign policy. By 1926, all the white settler dominions named on this map had gained control of foreign policy as well and had become members of the British Commonwealth of Nations. In colonies with non-white populations, however, independence movements were suppressed. In India, a massive uprising, the Sepoy Mutiny, occurred in 1857, largely because the British were insensitive to the local culture. The revolt was defeated by superior weapons, as were similar uprisings elsewhere in the 19th and 20th centuries. After World War I, however, attitudes began to change. After watching Europeans slaughter one another in battle, colonial peoples no longer looked at their rulers with the same respect. Increasing numbers of British colonial subjects began to support local independence movements, notably that in India led by Mahatma Gandhi. Such movements could no longer be easily suppressed. Nevertheless, as late as 1941, when troops from all parts of the empire were fighting alongside the British in a war against Germany, Italy and Japan, which were attempting to seize and control other countries, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was reluctant to extend to non-Europeans that part of the Atlantic Charter that referred to the right of all people to choose the form of government under which they live. The whole of Europe was shattered by World War II. Britain's manpower and resources were drained and its industries, once a standard for the world, had become old and out of date. The United States, which had built up its production capacities during the war, was now the world's leading economic power and a forceful political voice against the old system of colonial rule. Colonies that had once relied on trade with Britain now began building up their own industry and transportation and establishing new trading links. As the demand for independence grew, the British tried to head it off by urging that colonial peoples be given freedom only after they were educated and their economies better developed. This change of view was reflected in legislation. In 1929, the Colonial Development Act had required that government funds be spent in the colonies mainly for promoting commerce with and industry in the United Kingdom. In the 1940s and 50s, a series of acts amended this requirement, providing substantial sums for railroads, agricultural projects, schools and clinics, all for the direct benefit of the colonies. This new policy was part of an all-out effort by the British to acknowledge deeper responsibilities toward those they ruled. But by this time, the desire for independence had grown so strong in most parts of the empire that it could not so easily be quelled. India gained independence in 1947, amid much internal bloodshed and rioting. British India was divided between the predominantly Hindu state of India and the mainly Muslim state of Pakistan, from which Bangladesh later split off. The first black African colony to win freedom from British rule was Gold Coast. In 1957, Kwame Nkrumah was sworn in as the first president of the new nation of Ghana. Between 1957 and 1968, all these former colonies became independent, though in some cases freedom was granted only after armed struggle. The one exception was the white settler colony 
of southern Rhodesia, which declared independence illegally in 1965 without British consent in an effort to ensure government by the white minority over the black majority. Fifteen years later, in 1980, black majority rule was finally achieved and the new nation of Zimbabwe was officially granted independence. Freedom was not granted easily in places considered strategic for military or economic reasons. In the Suez Crisis of 1956, Britain, along with France, tried to reassert control over the canal, partly to protect the oil and other valuable commodities that still passed through it. But Britain and France were forced to give up the undertaking because of joint United States and Soviet opposition. In 1953, Prime Minister Anthony Eden had announced that the island of Cyprus would never be given independence because it was seen as a vital base for defending Western oil imports from the Middle East. By 1957, when the United Nations took steps to create an independent Cyprus, hostility between Greek and Turkish Cypriots was at a high point. While the British were in Cyprus allegedly to keep peace between these two hostile communities, the hostility had actually helped to ensure British control. The independence settlement of 1960 satisfied no one, and fighting has often broken out since. More than two decades later, Cyprus remained an armed camp, with its Greek and Turkish communities divided and bitter. Hong Kong ceded under duress by China to Britain in the 19th century, is likely to be one of the last British possessions to leave the empire. According to an agreement negotiated between Britain and China in 1984, the colony is to make a transition to Chinese administration by 1997. Long after independence, the effects of British rule linger in all parts of the former empire. And the question persists, was the British presence mostly a help or a hindrance to the colonies? Each particular issue has been argued both ways. The British introduced and financed industrial and commercial development in many places, but always to favour the mother country's interests. Would the colony on its own have built a different, more favourable industrial and commercial base? The British often introduced railway and paved highway systems. In many places, Kenya for example, bitter, long-lasting animosity was one result as whole populations were forcibly dislodged to make way for these roads. In addition, the roads were built for the benefit of colonial administrators as well as for the movement of goods important to Britain. Did the colony inherit a road system that best suits local needs? The same questions are raised about the placement of cables for telegraph, telephone and other modern communication systems, including radio and later television. The British often improved agriculture techniques, building irrigation systems and importing plants and animals. These innovations generally improved efficiency, production and living standards for some, while leaving others poorer than before. Although British-style education was introduced in many colonies, it was always on a limited scale. In India, early in the 20th century, for instance, only 1% of Indian children attended school. Even education was controversial. Classes were generally taught in English, partly because the British often lumped together under their rule peoples who spoke different languages, but the use of English left most people dissatisfied and cultural roots were weakened as students learned nothing of the great literature written in their own languages. The sons of the local ruling classes, who were given the best education, were taught the principles of democracy, including the concept of equal rights. But in practice, even this elite segment of the population was still disdained as natives by their British rulers. In Lahore, for instance, the British ignored local values entirely when they took over the tomb of a nobleman, a sacred site to some, to serve as the British government house. British parliamentary democracy and law served as models when former colonies created their own governments. But because the British forms were essentially alien, they were sometimes abused and in time replaced by other systems. Another legacy is the British concept of religion and morality. While Christianity was widely embraced, 
Tension and instability were often part of the process as people were exhorted to abandon rituals and habits that had held their society together. Racial prejudice in many parts of the former empire is another heritage that was fostered, although not always introduced, under British rule. In Africa, for instance, the British employed many Indians, treating them as superior to the native Africans. As a result, a bitter and lasting hatred developed between Africans and Indians. Even after independence, links have remained strong between Britain and many former colonies. Twenty-seven of them have joined the British Commonwealth. One, South Africa, dropped out in 1960. South Africa's apartheid policies embarrassed Britain and offended non-white Commonwealth nations. Even in those former colonies that have tried to favour trade with countries other than Britain after independence, the ties are hard to break. In some cases, the ties involve special trading arrangements or British investments, which still serve to shape the economy and daily lives of the people in these countries. This is a British trade pavilion in Ghana. To some people in the former colonies, it is symbolic of a new empire-building effort by Britain and other industrialised countries, using economic power in place of military force to gain control. Since the dissolution of the empire began late in the 1940s, Britain has given hundreds of millions of pounds in money and goods to colonies and former colonies as foreign aid. But even the value of this aid is disputed. While it may help to alleviate poverty and suffering, its main purpose, some argue, is to keep governments in power that are friendly to British interests. Money is often given on condition that it be used to purchase British goods and services, a industrial powers commonly follow when they grant gifts or loans. The British Empire's achievements and its failures both on a grandiose scale, cannot be summed up even in volumes of words and pictures. Every aspect of British daily life has been affected. Afternoon tea, something the world thinks of as typically British, began with the empire. Ketchup, calico, pajama, bungalow, and tattoo are just a few of the words that the colonies introduced into the English language. British writers have focused on empire subjects, from Rudyard Kipling, who wrote at the empire's height, to a host of modern writers. England's public buildings and monuments reflect imperial influences. Empire settings were featured in paintings by British artists. And Empire soldiers fought for the mother country in both world wars. Where the British had once emigrated by the tens of thousands to the colonies, by the 1950s, the Empire had become a source of cheap immigrant labour for Britain. Advertisements were placed in colonies and former colonies for jobs in Britain, the poorly paid jobs, such as driving buses or nursing, that did not attract white Britishers at a time of full employment. Because immigrant workers were poorly paid, they soon found themselves in a cycle of poverty, bad housing and poor education. Many immigrants also encountered racial prejudice, in part the result of attitudes formed during the days of the empire. Anger and racial tensions exploded into rioting in a number of British cities in the 1980s. By this time though, tiny Britain had become a poor relation among the wealthy industrial nations, economically far behind the United States, Germany and Japan, and its empire had shrunk to almost nothing.
Yet the imprint of the proud British lion remains wherever it once ruled. And in Britain, the memory, along with many of the trappings, persist. <laughs>